It looks a little bit uh, too childish. And as an adult, we know that, or we can realize that the eyelashes actually protect our eye from dust and dirt, and they tend to brush off to the right on the right side of the face and off to the left on the left side of the face and not be quite as long. Unless the person has really, really long fake eyelashes, they're not going to be very long. And um, men tend to have not very long eyelashes. Women tend to have longer eyelashes. And artists usually represent eyelashes as shading and a mass of shading rather than individual hairs. So you might see a girl's eyelashes something like this rather than focusing on every little detail. And maybe a few down here at the bottom, not as long. So it's more or less shaded and not every individual hair. So we have the eyelashes. Another thing that we need is eyebrows. And you get a lot of bang for your buck when it comes to emotional response, emotional expression, uh, when you do eyebrows. Because you can have eyebrows that um, look mean and mad, where they arch kind of down and up at the sides. Or they can look kind of upset and worried and kind of curve up like this. But for the most part, eyebrows tend to just kind of follow the orbital ridge of the skeleton and curve along with the curve of the eyeball. Like this, girls tend to have thinner eyebrows, guys tend to have thicker eyebrows. Sometimes girls have thinner eyebrows out towards the outside of the face and a little thicker on the inside. Just depends how they do their makeup or whatever. But you can have eyebrows that arch very high up if it's a villain, especially a lot of times they're represented as looking very evil with very pointy eyebrows. Uh, next we move on to the nose, and we need to know how big the nose is compared to the rest of the face. And a lot of times when students start drawing faces, back in elementary school you might have done a little cute little nose like this, but the nose is actually quite a bit longer, and in proportion to the face, um, it goes down about halfway from the eye line to the mouth line, or to the uh, chin line. And to know how wide to make that nose, we usually draw an imaginary line from the inside of the eyes down to the nose line. And that will give us about the width of the nose. And the nose, if you're looking at it from the front view, isn't going to be flattened. A lot of times people will draw noses like this or like this or like this. But what that really doing does is it's flattening the nose against the face kind of like Picasso's uh, paintings where he's looking at things from different angles. But if you're actually looking at the face from the front view, uh, you're going to see both nostrils, not just one nostril, not just one side of the nose. And what you're going to have is, if you imagine the tip of the nose as being kind of like a ball, it might be a skinny oval, or it might be a more round ball. No, it's not going to be a clown nose when we get done. We're going to erase some of these lines. But if we picture it as a ball, and then the left and right nostrils as smaller ovals or smaller balls, we begin to see uh, the basic underlying structure of the nose. And we're going to start with some nostrils. And we know that nostrils are holes in our head. But if we draw them too big like this, we're going to have kind of a piggy snout. And it's not going to look very cute or very good and re very realistic. Um, so when you take this oval that represents the nostril and you uh, look at it from the front view, it's going to be more of a flattened pancake shape kind of a little curve to it instead of the round or oval black holes. And they would go approximately in this area here and here, a little bit dark. And we would define the rest of the nose, the edges, like this. So that when we get done in a race, we have a basic structure for a nose. 
Sometimes you'll see a little bit of the curve of the sides of the nose, and sometimes you'll see just a little bit of a curve up here at the top, especially in young children and cute girls with their little upturned noses. Um, so we have the basic structure of the nose that we can put on there. And I'll go ahead and draw that in. And the nostril width goes out to the width of the space between the eyes. Now you could have uh, noses that are wider, or you could have noses that are narrower. But if they're too wide, they start to look more like a werewolf character or some kind of primate or Neanderthal uh, if they're like way out here. And if they're too narrow, it starts to look like somebody had very bad plastic surgery and their nose is just too narrow. You may have noticed that with, and no offense to Michael Jackson, but his nose had been shrunk a little bit too much. It was too narrow. It was kind of disturbing looking. So we've gotten uh, the relative proportions of the nose. I'll go ahead and draw the details of the nose here. Then we need a bridge for the nose. And the bridge of the nose is going to start up here at the eyebrow, or right around the eyebrow, right around the orbital ridge, and come down towards the nose. And usually, cartoon artists won't complete that line and draw the exact outline of the nose. They'll just indicate a little bit of shading, or just a little hint of where the line would be on one side or another of the face just to indicate that it's kind of popping out a little bit from the rest of the face. It doesn't have to be overly accentuated when you're drawing comic books. It can be very simplified. And that bridge of the nose can be more angular or it can be more curving. It's up to you. Next we come to the mouth area and actually underneath your mouth you have, or underneath your nose I should say, you have an indentation. This indentation is actually called a philtrum. If you've ever felt that little indentation below your nose. And that is actually the result of when your face is forming in the womb and all the bones and the muscle tissue and the skin tissue is growing it grows together and that is the last area that kind of seals up and finishes the growth of the outside part of your face and sometimes uh, when people are born that is not all sealed all the way and they need a little surgery to fix that um, but that is just kind of like a seam in your face but that seam affects how your lips look down here and if this curves down here at the bottom your lips are going to curve a little bit in the middle so that we don't have just kind of a football shape split in the middle for lips although cartoonists who do simple cartoons like Kim Possible and other cartoon characters they might have <clears throat> lips that look more like this but in realistic human lips you would have more of an indentation in the middle of the upper lip and that of course affects the bottom part of the upper lip here and then the lower lip might be rounded like this or it might be more angular or it might be very full and voluptuous especially if you have a character that is a female um, maybe a, a femme fatale sort of character in a comic book with very full lips, kind of like Angelina Jolie. So there's a number of different styles of lips you can experiment with. And how do we know the proportion of the mouth compared to the face? Well, if you draw an imaginary line from the pupil down to the mouth line, um, that's about how wide your mouth would be if you were smiling. So if I made this curve up and, and smiling, that's about where the corners of your mouth would touch if you were smiling. But if you're not smiling, it wouldn't be quite that wide. It would be a little bit narrower. Something like that. Um, the chin, usually sometimes you'll see a little bit of a curve underneath the mouth to indicate the chin. Sometimes you'll see a little bit of a cleft palate, or not a cleft palate, a uh, 
a cleft chin where you have a little indentation in the chin. Sometimes you'll see little dimples. Uh, you can add details like this if you want to to make your hero or your villain or your person look cool. Um, next we're going to move on to the ears. Now the ear from the, the front view, if you're looking at an ear, a full ear, actually is a little bit larger at the top and curves, but comes down and angles and is a little narrower at the bottom. It's kind of uh, like a bean shape a little bit. And there's a lot of complex architecture to the ear. Um, if you're uh, familiar with piercings, uh, some of the names of piercings come from the different uh, architecture of the ear, like we have a tragus, an anti-tragus, a helix, anti-helix. Um, we have the ear lobe. So there's a lot of complex architecture going on in the ear, but usually artists will figure out a way to simplify that, especially in comic book art. So you won't see necessarily all of that detail. It might not be quite so complicated. Um, but this is the ear from the front view. Uh, if you were to take this, just like I could take my hand, and turn it to the side view, the width is going to get narrower. So we're going to see an ear that is a little narrower from the front view than from the side view. And how you draw ears is up to you. You don't have to put a lot of detail in there. But you can determine the best way to draw an ear and you can style it after other artists and look at how they've drawn ears. But it doesn't need a super lot of detail. And your character's ears could be pointy if you wanted to. You could have a character that has like werewolf or elf ears. That would be kind of cool. And those ears, the proportion of the ears compared to the face is determined by the guidelines for the eyes and nose. Um, the ear usually starts around the eye guideline and comes down to the nose guideline. So we're not making a little character with little monkey ears. We're making a much more realistic proportioned human figure and human face. And then next we have to make this head look like it's not decapitated because right now it looks like a bald person who got their head cut off. But uh, we need to add a neck to it to make it look more like it's connected to a body and it's a complete human being. Back in the elementary days, you might have done a little stick neck or a pencil neck like this, very thin, kind of like in the uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid comic books, or, or books that they've made. Uh, and that's a very overly simplified way to do a neck, and it, if you had a head balancing on a little neck like that, it wouldn't stand up very long, it would fall over, your neck would break because it's too thin. If you actually feel the sides of your neck and where they touch your head, um, they go up somewhere to the jawline or even as far as maybe the ear and curve down a little bit towards your shoulders. So football players and male heroes tend to have wider necks, females tend to have more slender necks and they kind of curve and angle off into the body. And then finally, we need to add some hair to this character if we don't want them to be bald. And back in the olden days, when you were a kid, you might have drawn little hair like this or like this. And it just kind of sticks up on top of the oval or the circle of the head. But we know, as we get older, we realize that people have uh, a hairline. And that hairline is somewhere between the eye line and the top of the head. And you can have hair that kind of goes in front of the forehead, that would be like your bangs, and you could have hair that kind of comes back, uh, swept back behind your head, like in a ponytail, or you could have a short haircut and it wouldn't be very long and it would just kind of curve back that way. Some of the hair might come along uh, the side of the head, either in curls or in sideburns, uh, and the hair also goes further than the oval of the head because your hair has a thickness to it and it may kind of curve over back around to your ears or even behind your ears. You might have hair that comes down here 
might be very curly. Um, in anime style cartoons 